Members of the Tufts community and guests, good afternoon. And welcome to Tufts University, and thank you for joining us today. Before the program begins, I ask that you give your attention to a few guidelines for the safety and convenience of all our guests. First, please silence your cell phones at this time. During the lecture, you are advised to remain seated for the safety of all guests. If you must leave your seat, please clear the aisle promptly. There's a large audience for today's lecture, and it's important to keep the aisles clear for safety reasons. Any guest who leaves the Gantcher Center will not be readmitted. Please be aware of the emergency exits at the back and sides of the Gantcher Center. We ask that you please refrain from taking photos or videos of the event today. Thank you for your attention, and now I am pleased to introduce Anthony P. Monaco, President of Tufts University. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome students, faculty, staff, and friends to this afternoon's conversation with the Honorable United States Supreme Court Justice, Sonia Sotomayor. We are honored to host Justice Sotomayor on our campus today. Her visit is especially appropriate given Tufts' deep commitment to active citizenship and civic engagement. We have many local elected officials from our host communities and the state legislature joining us in the audience this afternoon, including Mayor Stephanie Burke of Medford. Thank you all for joining us for this special occasion. This afternoon's program will take the form of a conversation on stage between Justice Sotomayor and Professor Peter Wynne. Following their discussion, Professor Wynne will moderate a question and answer period between the justice and pre-selected students. For the past three decades, Peter Wynne has served as a professor of history in the Tufts School of Arts and Sciences, specializing in Latin America. Earlier in his career, Professor Wynne taught at Princeton University. During that time, he had the privilege of teaching a remarkable undergraduate from the Bronx in four classes and advising her senior thesis on the history of Puerto Rico in the mid 20th century. Professor Wynne's former student is today's special guest, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Sonia Sotomayor. After graduating summa cum laude from Princeton, Justice Sotomayor received her JD from Yale Law School, where she was an editor of the Yale Law Journal. She began her legal career as an assistant district attorney in New York, and then at the law firm of Pavia and Harcourt. From 1992 to 1998, she served as a judge of the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, and from 1998 to 2009, on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In May 2009, President Obama nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, she assumed this role on August 8, 2009. She has the distinction of being the U.S. Supreme Court's first Hispanic and Latina justice. In addition to her work on the court, Justice Sotomayor has demonstrated a long-standing commitment to civic education. She serves on the boards of iCivics, a leading provider of civic education curriculum and resources that reaches millions of students each year across our country. And she is also a best-selling author. In her recently released children's book, Just Ask, Be Different, Be Brave, Be You, Justice Sotomayor pulls from her own experience with juvenile diabetes to encourage children to celebrate their unique differences and abilities, a lesson we can all be reminded of in our daily interactions. We are looking forward to hearing more about her insights and experiences in the conversation to come. Please extend a warm welcome to Professor Peter Wynne and the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Way back when, I know I didn't ever imagine this, 
I doubt you do, too. No, I don't think so. I... But I'm delighted that it is happening. And I want to add my personal bienvenida to your welcome to Tufts. Gracias, señor. And to thank you on what I know is an extraordinarily busy day and a busy schedule, taking the time to come here to have this conversation with me and with the Tufts community, which you can see has turned out in force to take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you for being here, all of you. I got driven over here. You had a walk. <laughs> <laughs> and when we first met, you were asking questions, and I was trying to come up with answers. And now I think perhaps our positions are reversed. <laughs> so let me go to my first question. When we first met, you were Sonia, not yet Justice Sotomayor, a young woman from uh, a modest family from New York, Latina, who was trying to un at first understand and then adapt and finally succeed in the very different elite Anglo environment of Princeton. What did you learn from that experience which helped you succeed not only at Princeton, but also at Yale Law School, within the judiciary, and which might help many of the students here succeed on their own? There's a little part of me that would love to go back and do a do-over with college. You have the chance to avoid, um, I don't want to call them mistakes, but I want to call them the, the learning, the bumps of learning lessons as I went through Princeton. But I think my undergraduate career was the seminal point in my life in transforming me into a person who was capable of succeeding. Mm -hmm. And that's the value of an undergraduate education. It's called the liberal arts education for a purpose. And its purpose is to ensure that when you leave here, you are and should be in essence, and it's a lesson I learned as in Princeton, you should be a well-rounded human being. And that means I, I worry that in today's drive, um, to have majors and minors. See all these resumes with kids who go to college. Two majors, two minors. I don't know what else you do. That Sounds like Tufts. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, that you forget that this is the place for you to explore topics you know nothing about. This is the place for you to learn about the world mm -hmm. around you and not necessarily use that knowledge in a profession but just to give you a base in which you become, believe it or not, a more interesting person. The more well-rounded you are, the better you're gonna perform in your profession, regardless of what the profession is. Whether it's computer sciences, regular sciences, medicine, engineering, if you know what is in the world around you, you're gonna do your job better. They built a courthouse in the Southern District of New York and I went in for my first court appearance and the robing room had no closet for the robe. Um, failure of, I think you become so specialized that um, you forget about the world. When you're here, take topics and things you know nothing about. Take a religion course just to learn about the religions that are causing wars, well, war, world wars. Take a philosophy course, take an economics course, a so, 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 sociology, uh, psychology. And then specialize later in what you're doing, but become first a well-rounded person. And I think that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I was so scared at Princeton that I took just basic courses. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. So I took all those courses trying to figure out where I was gonna end up. To my good fortune, I ended up in the history department 
and hence with Professor Wood. <laughs> but I didn't start out knowing what I was going to do. Second, you are in a place where there are people from a, across the United States and probably people from around the world. You have an opportunity to meet people who live lives differently than you do. Befriend them. Don't stay clustered in your own background. Open the world to yourself by making friends with people who are different than you are. And I certainly think that that has helped me enormously in my career. Because in each place that I've been, I've used my ethnic group as a security blanket, as my anchor to, you know, it gave me a sense of familiarity and of comfort and security to be with some people who were closer to what I was and to my experiences. But I always made a conscious decision to go out and befriend other people that were different than me. And now I travel the United States on book tours and otherwise, and there's always people that I know from college everywhere mm. I go. And they're not all Latinos. They're from every background imaginable. And they have supported me throughout my ventures in my life. Third, and I think this is critically important, and perhaps the most important thing, use this as your laboratory for experimenting with yourself. And by that I mean, I, in my book, My Beloved World, describe the difficulties I had with writing. Mm -hmm. And college was the perfect environment for me to tackle that problem. You have professors, graduate students or assistant professors, full professors, who are devoted to you as undergraduates. And if you do the thing that I have found most helpful, even to this day, just ask questions. When you don't know, ask someone to explain it to you. It's almost as simple as that. I didn't know how to write, and I went to you and said, can you help me figure out how to do it better? And you did. Um, now, it's possible somebody will say no. Anything's possible in life. But that means you just go to somebody else. You just don't get discouraged. And how many of you have been in a classroom where their professor has been talking and you don't understand what they're saying and finally somebody raises their hand and says, I'm not quite sure. And all the heads go like this. <laughs> I'm not sure either. There's no reason for that. But as some of you may know, I am known to be a great questioner at oral argument. I got that from my undergraduate experience. You should too. Because if you go around life with curiosity, people will see it. They'll respond to you. They'll engage with you. And they will teach you things that will help you. And so for me, those probably were the greatest lessons of my undergraduate life. Many, many more, by the way, but I'm going to cut my answer. <laughs> no, I'm sure that's true. When the well-rounded, tough student comes to choose the profession, I know from my conversations with people here in this room that many of them are thinking of a legal career inspired by your example, and maybe even dreaming of someday becoming a judge or a Supreme Court justice themselves. What would be your advice to them? See, advice I give every student. Live your life with passion. Every single thing you do, every course you take, every student activity you engage in, it's not quantity that counts, it's quality. Mm -hmm. Maximize what you take out of every experience you have. And especially for law school, it doesn't matter what undergraduate course you take. They don't care, law schools. They want to know that you get good grades. 
and they want to see that you're a leader. And to see that, they don't want to see you belonging to 50 different organizations. And there are plenty of students who list 50 different organizations. What they're really looking for is where have you shown real leadership? Where have you done initiatives or taken charge of new things? Peter remembers, because I involved him, I started a course, or not started, but did a course with Peter. I wanted to learn about my background and I knew nothing about my Puerto Rican history. And I asked him, and with his guidance, we put together a course. Um, that's a tiny example of leadership, but law schools and everybody's interested in that. Mm -hmm. How many doctors, potential aspirin, uh, why am I having, I must be tired today. I'm sure. How many are here are aspiring to be doctors? And how many of you who are should know that medical schools are very worried about the fact that so many doctors don't know how to relate to their patients. They're so stuck in their sciences and medicine that they haven't learned to be social creatures. And many medical schools are now admitting students who haven't done their traditional curricula but who have shown those same qualities I'm talking about, leadership, mm -hmm. and admitting them to medical school. And as with law school, you have to have good grades and you have to be at the top of your class and all of that other stuff. But they have recognized that what I said at the beginning, being a well-rounded person in mm -hmm. every field takes you further. And so if you have aspirations, of doing anything, take advantage of every moment that you're exposed to something new. Squeeze out of it every bit of information you can, every bit of knowledge you can, and engage in the world around you and, and get to know the world. Be curious about it constantly. Learn about things you know nothing about just for the sake of learning. You'll be surprised when those things become of value. I spent three weeks on the district court learning about the mosquito repellent. Johnson & Johnson was su suing, su uh, suing Avon for uh, false advertisement related to its skin, uh, skin so soft. Now, what did I need to know about mosquito repellent? Not much. But when I went to Africa, I knew what to buy. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of inspiration, I'm struck by how you have inspired so many young people from such diverse backgrounds, uh, like the preteen daughter of a, of a friend who has read and reread the young adult version of your autobiography many times. And last Halloween, decided to dress up as Justice Sotomayor. <laughs> How, how do you explain this ability you have to inspire and to get through and to mobilize for, for good effects and good things uh, so many young people from such diverse backgrounds? The reason I wrote my memoir, one of many, but a really critical reason, and I describe it in the preface to my book. My memoir is My Beloved World, by the way. Um, and I know some of the students have told me they've read it, um, was because I know that there's so many people out there like me who have lived in difficult and challenging circumstances, who really hunger to know that despite all of that, happy endings are possible. Uh, Peter, as you know, I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was seven and a half. Uh, my family was, you graciously called it modest, but we lived in public housing in the Bronx, subsidized public housing. My father died when I was nine. Um, we were poor and we struggled. And I struggled with my dad's alcoholism mm. and with so many other things. And that I can show people 
that despite all of those challenges, I can make it. The answer is, so can you. I am truly no different than any one of you. I have the same human flaws. I have the same insecurities. I have the same needs. Um, and I have the same difficulties, whether it was learning how to write English at, properly or to learn how to speak pro English properly. All of those things take effort, but they can be done. And so it's the reason I decided to write my memoir in the hopes that it would inspire people who might find it otherwise difficult to believe that it's possible. Wonderful answer. Spe but speaking about diversity, let's talk about your new book. Ah. And when I learned that you were writing a children's book about <laughs> diversity, I assumed it was about ethnic diversity. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it was going to take off from being a Latina growing up in the Bronx and, 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 and go from there, drawing on, on your experience. But it, it, it is a very different book than I imagined. Um, I don't know if you can talk about bodily diversity uh, well, or, or, or diversity of disabilities, but also the benefits that come from that. Exactly. So This is Just Ask. Just came out. It's 12 children, each of them with different childhood challenges. Some physical, some not. So it goes from me being a kid. If you can't see, it's a beautiful book. Sitting in a flower, giving myself a shot of medicine. And I have children in the book with the most, what were to me the most common childhood conditions, from allergies to asthma, to dyslexia, to hyperactivity, to blindness and deafness, to being in a wheelchair, to Down syndrome. There's 12 different conditions. And the message of the book is, if you see a child doing something different, if you see anybody doing something different, don't assume the worst in them. Why don't you just ask them why? And the story, and the message was born from an incident that happened to me in my 30s. For most of my young adulthood, I was ashamed of my diabetes and I hid it. I rarely told my friends that I had it. My roommates, yes, because I had syringes and vials in the room, but not the other people who were even important in my life. And if at a restaurant, I would order my food and then excuse myself to go to the restroom to hide that I was giving myself my insulin. Well, this particular night in a restaurant, the stall was empty and I went in and did it outside. And as I was finishing, a woman walked in and I was putting away the syringe. I walked out, I sat down, finished dinner, started to walk out and I walked past her table and hear her whisper, she's a drug addict. And I stopped and I'm filled with shame, mortified. And then a little bit of controlled anger stepped in. And I walked back and I said, madam, I'm not a drug addict. I'm a diabetic. And you saw me taking my insulin and it's medicine that saves my life every day. Don't presume the worst in people when you see them doing something different. Just ask them why. 30 years later. <laughs> Great. One, my last question is a very Tufts question. Tufts prides itself on being an institution that promotes active citizenship. I know in your lifetime, you've also promoted active citizenship and been an example. What advice would you give to young people who want to spend their adult lives making this world a better place? Um, one person is not gonna fix all the problems in the world. And if that's your goal, you're gonna fail miserably. What you have to do is find the 
problem or set of problems that interests you in particular, that raise that passion that I was talking about, and it could be in anything because small steps are important to change the world. It's all of us working together every single day and each of us working as a collective to make the various and so many problems that we have better. And so my answer is don't be a bystander in life. Don't let things happen to you. In the law, laws are made by men and women. And if you don't like them, get up and change them. You start in the voting booth, but you also start in the lobbying and the talking and the writing about issues that are important to you. If it's something to do with the quality of education, join your school board and get involved. If it has to do with medical care, then volunteer at a hospital and work on making better their access to their population. All problems require solutions and only people can affect those solutions. And so for me, my advice to become an involved citizen is, and, and I use that word loosely. Mm -hmm. I use citizen not in the official um, national belonging, are you a citizen of the US? I'm talking about a being a citizen of your community and whether you're involved in ensuring that you're giving it a piece of yourself. Now, some people are leaders in change and others are followers. Doesn't matter which one you are, followers help get things done. They let the visionaries sort of take the lead. That's okay, without you it doesn't get done either. So please, when you're living your life now. Identify the things that excite you and go out and change the world because you will be a much happier place and the world will be a much better place because you're a part of it and you're working at it. So for me, as you can tell, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about uh, civic education in schools, not only because I want you to learn about the government, but I want you to learn about your voice in this government. It's there, but you have to be, you have to make it be heard. Thank you. We so in. I'm getting up now, because I don't like sitting down. And, and I like walking around. And what's going to happen now is it's time for student questions that have been vetted, pre-selected from those that were submitted. Now, the, there's a lot of men and women around the room with little things in their ears. They're my marshals. They're here to protect me from myself. <laughs> they don't like I walk around you, but the deal is you can't get up unexpectedly or they get scared. <laughs> so I'll walk around, I'll shake your hand, I may even grab a hug from some of you, but you stay seated, okay? Okay. All right. Now, I want the questioners to identify themselves and then ask their questions. Uh, Carolina, the first question. Hi, I'm Carolina McCabe, and I'm a first year planning on studying civic studies and international relations. Now, you already know I like what you're studying. <laughs> <laughs> well, having outstanding academic and judicial credentials, you also bring a rich and diverse background to the Supreme Court as the first Hispanic on the court, as well as experiences you mentioned dealing with diabetes from a young age, being raised by a widowed mother facing financial challenges and discrimination. How do you think those diverse experiences have impacted your perspective during your legal career and as a justice on the Supreme Court? And do you think that greater diversity in federal and state court system is important? All right, do I need this? I guess I do. Um, I'll answer your last question. Yes, I think it's very important to have diversity on the Supreme Court, but not the kind that most of you are thinking about. I don't think it's as important, although very important, to have gender, racial, and ethnic 
uh, diversity on the court. We're not religiously diverse enough yet. Um, we have one Protestant, three Jews, and the rest are Catholics, myself included, okay? I am more worried about the lack of experienced diversity on the Supreme Court. We have no justice with criminal law experience. We have no justice with environmental experience. We have only one civil rights lawyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. All right, now. Women's issues are critical. Don't minimize it. But we have so many different civil rights questions today, not just special needs. Um, to me, the court needs those perspectives, not because they are going to control the outcome of any case or any issue, but because the different perspectives enrich the conversation we have. When people can bring in their life experiences and at least explain an argument, even if the others don't accept it, then at least you know that everybody's perspective has been aired in the room. Now, you ask me how all of my different experiences influence my decisions. I have no idea. <laughs> Some are contradictory. I was a state prosecutor, and in private practice, I represented basically the Fortune 500 companies of Europe. And I defended them most of the time. All right? Um, I went to Catholic school, not public school. Um, I was raised by a single mother, not a, my dad wasn't around. Who's, who could tell how any one experience influences any one judgment I make? I'm a amalgam of all of my life experiences, just like every one of you are. You're not a person who wears glasses alone. You're not a person who likes blue. You're a whole human being. And every experience gives you a different perspective and a different feeling about his things. And so for me, I don't value diversity for the sake of diversity. I value it for its contributions to the conversation. We are making the most important legal decisions that affect your lives every single day. If you don't believe law affects you every day, please remember when you stop at the red light, why are you doing it? Because the law says you have to. Smart law. But there are so many law, other laws that control your lives in ways you don't consciously perceive, but which are affecting you directly. You want the people involved in interpreting the laws that are passed to have as many different life perspectives as possible in the hopes that we won't miss something important. And by the way, that doesn't mean we're infallible. As many of you know, I dissent a lot. <laughs> so, but it gives us a better shot when there's diversity. Peter? For the next question. By yeah. the way, come over here. Follow me. <laughs> Where's my lovely photographer? Right behind me? Come on, I take a picture with the students who ask Rabia, questions. Rabia, your question. Hi. Hi. Go ahead, Peter, I can multitask. <laughs> Where are you? I'm here. Ah, thank you. What's the second question? Okay. The thank second you. question ah. is from Rabia. Oh, it was you I want for the picture. Come on back, too. <laughs> Go ahead, ask your question, sweetie. What I'm advice, listening. <laughs> what advice do you have for students, specifically women of color, that are looking to go into public service but often feel overshadowed or ignored in these spaces? Well, I 
I'm trying to say this in a nice way. <laughs> and maybe there isn't. When I um, was in law school, one of my friends said to me, I love you, Sonia, because you argue like a man. And I looked at him and I said, Rudy, should I punch you out? <laughs> what in the world made you say something so stupid? And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, women, when they ask a question in the classroom, will always say to the professor, professor, have you thought of this? Or I don't know if this makes any sense. Or maybe I could be wrong. It's qualified, right? He says, a man always just jumps in and says, oh, you're saying that, but I don't think that's right. Listen to your next classroom discussion. And that's what you're going to hear. Well, I think we do feel not heard. And I think we feel not heard because we don't make ourselves be heard. Because we are tentative in our presentations, because we often are unsure of ourselves and don't know how to take command of a room. I'm a Supreme Court justice, but you're listening to me because my voice projects, doesn't it? Because I modulate it. I'm not monotone. Because I have a presence in which I show you Hey, listen to me. I'm, I do intimidate some lawyers. Um, my, my point is, when you are going to be in a room, you have to be thoroughly prepared. You have to be confident of yourself, even if you're not. And sometimes you just have to practice being confident. You have to sit there and force them to listen by the persuasiveness of your argument and by its clarity. And so uh, it's not, I said, I wasn't sure you were going to like the answer. And even with all of that, I can't convince some of those guys to vote my way a lot of times. <laughs> um, so it's not like it's always going to work. But I think we have a better chance when we believe in ourselves and believe that we have something important to say. That confidence is 90% of what convinces people that others are right. How many of you have been in a room with a real bully who by emphatic statement pushes people to do things? I don't want to be that person, but notice the trait that makes people respond. Next. Next question, Jose. Where are you, Jose? <laughs> ask your question first and then follow me, OK? okay. Stand there and uh, ask your question. You make me really proud of being Latino, so I'm really happy for you to be here. Thank uh, you. My name is Jose Martinez, uh, po probably a poli sci major, but we'll see. And then, <laughs> so my question is, what were the emotions and thoughts that went through your head when you were selected as the first Latina justice? Did you feel like you were changing the norms in a certain way of what a Supreme Court justice looks like for younger kids like me? No. Um, come around that way. Um, I was scared witless of going to the Supreme Court. No social media. Um, and during the nomination process, there were certain articles <laughs> that said I wasn't smart enough. 
And there were certain anonymous people who were complaining that I wasn't very nice in the courtroom. Now, all of my colleagues on the Second Circuit came out publicly and said the allegations were not true. But they hurt. And they hurt deeply. Because I had spent a lifetime, I thought, building up a positive reputation. And I actually paused and thought to myself, should I be doing this? And I actually considered pulling out of the nomination process. And I talked to one friend who then talked to other friends. I've forgiven her, but it took me a while to do that. And one of those people came up to me and said, stop feeling sorry for yourself. This is just not about you. It's about, and her daughter was eight years old, it's about my eight-year-old daughter and her being able to see someone like us in a position of power. And I realized that she was right. I had made it about me. And I realized not only that that was selfish, because when you do things for yourself, you lose sight of the value of what you're doing. And so at that moment, I stayed in. And you know what happened <laughs> and where I am. Um, but I do understand it's part of the question that Peter asked earlier, that those in the public, thank you, do take heart from seeing me there. Now, I forewarn you, one of these days I'm gonna write an opinion you don't like. <laughs> if I spend a lifetime not doing that, then I'm doing something wrong as a judge. Because I don't write opinions based on what I think the answer should be. I write opinions on my, what I think the law says they should be. And so remember something. One of the things that happens to everyone is that idols, including your parents, eventually become human, don't they? And most children at some point get upset when they realize mommy and daddy have flaws. Well, the same thing with the idols you have made. I'm a human being. I'm here to show you how human I am. I make mistakes, and so does the court. We are fallible. Even though the saying is, we're not right because we're right, and we're not infallible because we're right. We're right because they tell us we can be right. <laughs> um, we're the last word in a lot of things. But for me, I understand that. And I beg those who get to know me to remember always, I am a human being just like you. And I'm not perfect, neither are you, none of us are. But we can still try to do our very best and we can still try to help in every way we can, knowing that we're imperfect. Thank you. Now, a question that cuts the other way, from the court to the community. Lydia? Hi, how are you? Hi, sweetie. Ask the question. Okay. Um, first, let me just say, it's such an honor to be in front of you right now. Um, my name is Lydia Oldiesius, and I'm a sophomore studying political science and civic studies. Um, so throughout your incredible career, you have been an outspoken judge and justice now. How have you continued to stay, conti to stay connected to your community, roots, and values, even when it's not easy? Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, you know something? You... I'm here, right? I'm here because 
we live a rather monastic experience. I got this beautiful office in Washington, DC. I've got seven people who work for me directly, a whole courthouse that indirectly helps my office. Um, and the other eight people, the other eight justices have the same thing. And we have all have our little fiefdoms, our little places where we spend day in and day out and day in and day out. It can get monastic and isolating. And I know that. It's one of the reasons I've chosen to speak to groups that a lot of my colleagues don't traditionally speak to. So I come to colleges, but I also go to high schools. I've gone to grammar schools, uh, both middle school and primary schools. I've sat with a Head Start program, a bunch of kids. And one little boy was sitting there with me and we're playing together. And he reaches behind him to get something and he sees my picture, which was on the side of his cabinet. And he looks at the picture and looks at me, looks at the picture, looks at me, and then says, you're her. <laughs> he had no idea who I was. <laughs> they had talked to him about me, but I was a figure that teachers talked about, you know? That reminded me of being human. And so for me, my outreach is to the larger community because I do want to stay grounded. And I do want to stay a part of all of you. Because if I'm going to render rulings or participate in rendering rulings that are going to affect you, I want to know how. And so I do spend a lot of time. And that includes in a lot of different communities, just not in the Latino community in isolation. I do, you know, I go to Puerto Rico every year. Um, I do stuff there. I certainly do some things that are related to my culture and to my life within my culture. You know, I went to Puerto Rico and saw Lin-Manuel Hamilton. Um, you know, that was pretty cool, okay? Um, so, and, and, you know, I've, I go to bilingual programs. I do all sorts of things. All of my books, all four of my books are immediately translated from English to Spanish and published on the same day. That is so, so rare because I want to ensure that kids like me who didn't speak English first can have access to materials that other kids are reading. And so that's why I do it, okay? Um, but you ask me how, you have to make the effort. It doesn't just happen on its own. You have to take the time. And I've always said to people who are busy, and that's all of you, you're all in college, um, it's so easy when you're in college, maybe to consider, maybe I won't go home for this holiday. You know, I got something more fun to do, or I want to study something. Well, those holidays are really important to your families. And those times are memories that will carry you in your old age when they're not around anymore. You know, the holidays that I went back and spent with my grandmother, she's gone now. I can't do that anymore. But I still carry them here. And every Christmas Eve, the day she died, I was with her. I had come home from college and didn't leave the hospital for three days and she died on the third. I'll never regret doing that. You have to make time for the people you love. And you have to sometimes balance the competitions in your life and decide priorities. I know for me that I've learned very important lessons in life. 
death, illness, weddings. <laughs> Disparate things, right? They're the three most important things in people's lives. If you're a family member or you're a friend and you're present at those three things, you will be loved forever. Because that defines people's understanding of you caring enough to make time for them when life is either the most joyous or the most difficult. And so that's how I do it. Um, I work like the Dickens. Some of you may know I issued a dissent yesterday in a case. Um, <laughs> there's a two hour difference between here and, well, I was three hours when this started and then two hours and yesterday an hour behind. Um, and throughout the day I was talking to my office and my poor law clerks were working through the night as I finished up my stuff and went back and worked with them over the phone. So you can make time. It just may cost you a little sleep. <laughs> For our last question takes us back to the court and seems particularly relevant to the court. Uh, Peter? Hello. Hello, Peter. How are you? That's, that's good. It's nice to meet you. Uh, my name. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Peter Smiley. Um, I'm a first year planning on studying CS in uh, computer science in, at Tufts. And I was wondering how you manage relationships and interact with other Supreme Court justices who might have uh, differing political views. The one thing I know about every single justice, myself included, is that every one of us shares one passion, the court. Every one of us is devoted to that institution and what it represents in our system of government. We all revere the Constitution. We all believe in our Republican form of government. We all care equally deeply about doing the best job we can to uphold those values. We may differ in how we believe and what we believe is the best answer to do that, but I don't mistake our differences as reflecting ill will on their part. It is a real conversation that we have. And our differences are there to show us that there are no clear answers. That we have to really work at coming up with right answers. It is, I fear, too easy for people to fail to listen when what they're hearing is different than what they think. The impulse is to think the other person's mistaken. It's much harder to keep an open mind and respectfully listen to each other. And most of the time when we do, we can identify the chasm, the fault line that separates us. And it's much more easy when you can do that out of respect than when you assume that because someone disagrees with you, they're bad people. They're not. They have reasons for why they disagree. Sometimes the reasons may not seem compelling to you because you value something else more. But if you deal with people out of respect, you can disagree agreeably. 
I do believe that today, our politicians have forgotten how to do that. And it's my prayer, like I think the rest of you, that they figure out a way to do that. Um, but I think that you guys should set the example. Good luck to you. So, Sonia, I want to thank you not only for being here, but for your incredibly thoughtful answers to our questions. You've given us much food for thought as individuals, as in, in terms of us, in people's studies, and in terms of their lives. And for all of that, on behalf of everyone here from the Tufts community, thank you. Thank you, everybody.